billion is nine trillion. That's three trillion dollars. So in human costs, a billion. Uh, a, a, thousand, million, a million people getting exposed if the cost is even a million dollars per person that's um yeah nine that's that's a that's a trillion dollars yeah so there's one trillion dollars in death human life yes between one and five trillion dollars right depending on the the actuarial value is what we're guessing between one and five trillion dollars of death right. in japan right okay I, i've just recorded that so thanks uh Good morning. This is Warren Pollock. I'm here with Arnie Gunderson. During his uh, nuclear industry career, Arnie managed and coordinated projects at 70 nuclear power plants around the country. He frequently speaks on television, radio, and public meetings. He gives expert testimony to Congress and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Arnie, can you tell me a little bit more about yourself? Well, that was pretty good. I'm older than dirt, I guess, is a way of <laughs> narrowing it down. Um, yeah, I've... Um... You know, I've, I've been at it for 40 years as a as an executive and a consultant. The, um, uh, the 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 key issues in my mind are um, are nuclear can be safe or it can be cheap, but the 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 question is where do you make where do you draw that line? It seems to me that a lot of times we're making the decision to make nuclear cheap, and at the same time, then of course uh, adversely affecting safety. Right. I mean, our talk today is going to be a little bit different than I think some of your other talks, which have been a little bit technical. What I'd like to drill in today is really the economic and unfactored costs in nuclear energy. Now, how many nuclear reactors are there, do you think, worldwide operation, uh, in operation? Well, there's 440 worldwide, 104 in the U.S. So about a quarter of them are in the U.S. Uh, on a per capita basis, France has the most. They have uh, 58, um, but of course it's a smaller country. And how many of these reactors have failed during their 40-year lifespan? Well, of the... Um, Catastrophically, I mean, in, 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 oh, meltdown, in meltdown or a fuel pool leak or... Well, it, since, um, since Three Mile Island, we've had Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and now uh, three units at um, uh, at Fukushima that have melted down. So I guess we have to say six in the last 35 years. So the, the chance of a meltdown works out to be about one every six years. One every six years, or as a percentage basis, it would be, uh, uh, give me a ballpark. <laughs> uh, well, six out of 400 is uh, about one and a half percent. So would you get on an air, airplane oh. with that rate of failure? No, over I would its not. lifetime. So we, no. no, so we have. <clears throat> this is the problem with the nuclear energy, and this is why I called you up, because if if we have a way of looking at this which we can understand in our normal lives, then the whole question of nuclear power gets changed around. So by asking this question, would you get on an airline with this rate of airplane with this rate of failure? We would have planes dropping every single day from the skies with that kind of rate of failure, given the number of, of planes. You're bouncing around a little bit if you're leaning on the desk, but that's okay. So, um, I, was, I was nodding in agreement. You're nodding in agreement. <laughs> so we have this thing, uh, complex systems, all right? And let's say that something works 99%. A single moving part is 99% effective. When you take two moving parts and you put them together, both with 99% effectiveness, What's the odds of failure? Is it ninety nine percent, or is it? No, it's well. You multiply the uh, the ninety nine times the ninety nine, so it's about ninety eight percent. Not quite uh, when you do the multiplication, but it's about that. And how many parts does a nuclear reactor have? Ten thousand. Ten thousand parts. So you could have a, a complex system that has very good percentage um, efficacy, very good percentage performance, and when you add in the whole system then you get a very much riskier system than you would other, otherwise, just because of the complexity. No, you're absolutely right. And the current nuclear reactors, are they overly complex, or can they be made much simpler? Well, the, the, you know, the current plants, um, there's a thing called bathtub curve in, in reliability. And if you think of a bathtub as steep and then flat and then curved, uh, as plants get old, <clears throat> they start 
you know, just like a car, they're going to break in the first month or they're not going to break for five years. And then gradually over time, they start to break more often. So, you know, those numbers you were talking about, 99 percent are changing adversely now because most of the nuclear fleet in America is over 30 years old. So they're starting to come up that curve in the bathtub curve. It's um, it, we've noticed in the last year the dramatic increase in the number of force outages in nuclear power. And it's exactly because of that. You know, instead of 99.9, now they're 99, and it's starting to go down. Right. And it's, it's very interesting to me because if you could run your car for 10 years, you've made payments on it, it's paid in full, and it doesn't cost you very much to run. Is that the same with nuclear energy? Um, uh, most of the plants in operation now are in, incredibly cheap compared to most of the plants that are being uh, proposed. You know, like Vermont Yankee was a, a hundred a hundred million to build, and uh, uh, the new plants down in Georgia are going to be twenty billion to build. And there's a little bit of difference in output there, but it's still about a factor of a hundred more expensive to buy new rather than keep the old nukes running. Right, and so they don't cost you anything. You've paid to f them off, and then you could depreciate them. And my question is, what happens to like steel and all of the components that are bombarded with radiation? Do they maintain their integrity or do they degrade? With well, <clears throat> the nuclear reactor vessel is about the only thing that really degrades from radiation. And it has a thing called the nil ductility transition temperature. And as the reactor gets older, you have to heat it up more before you put pressure on it or else it's brittle like glass. And that's what happened at uh, Fukushima 1. It was cooling down too fast uh, when the accident began. So the operators turned off the cooling system because they didn't want it to get brittle and shatter like glass. But most of the problems are not in the steel. They're in the plastic. They're, they're in the, the, the electric wiring and all the insulation. And uh, that seems to be where the biggest concern is. Right. I had seen one nuclear reactor in my life, which was in Brookhaven National Labs. It must have been built in the 40s or 50s. And it was just, just a hunk of concrete with holes in it. So I think they just put the pile in, in into it. And yes. then they had control rods that were either horizontal, probably vertical was the control rods. But it looked like a very simple device. Are the nuclear reactors today that simple? Or are they trying to generate a lot of electricity with the complexity or... What's the story? Well, <clears throat> what's happened is the, the, the simplicity has disappeared because we've made these things so big. Um, you know, in, in um, let's look at Dresden one, which is a little tiny reactor in uh, Illinois. Then Dresden two is about four times bigger, and it wasn't more powerful, rather, and it wasn't four times bigger, which means it's a lot harder to get the water into it to cool in the event of an accident. So the complexity has gone up because we haven't kept, um, we haven't made the cores bigger as the power has gone up. We've tried to squeeze more horses into the same room. Really? And have they done that with recycled fuel as well, where they're taking now plutonium and putting it into the fuel mix? <laughs> In the U.S., uh, Jimmy Carter um, killed the reprocessing of fuel in the U.S., and uh, it was an economic decision. Uh, the, the cost to uh, put plutonium, to, to recycle the old fuel, adds about a million dollars per bundle compared to just taking it out of the ground and, and, uh, and using new fuel. So recycling is much more expensive than using, um, using new nuclear fuel. Right. Uh, that's. I heard that basically uh, MOX was about $300 a pound or so, which is the recycled fuel. Yeah. And then the uranium itself might be 40 or $50 a pound right out of the ground. So that's an economic decision that's being made. And if we looked at the cost of the full cycle, then the cost of nuclear would be higher. And full cycle, I mean, what's a full cycle of a uh, of, of a nuclear fuel, Arnie? What am I trying to say? Yeah, the, the nuclear fuel cycle. Right. The, uh you know, it starts with digging it out of the ground, and that's heavily subsidized. It's usually on native lands that we we take over cheaply. And then there's also a lot of cancers from the um, the airborne dusts that are also highly radioactive in some of the indigenous populations near the near the mines. Then it goes and c gets converted into yellow cake, which is an acidic process. And we've got you know radioactive ponds that are highly acidic. As a matter of fact, nuclear plants kill more birds than um, windmills because these ponds out in the West, uh, migratory birds will land on it and then they just die, not from the radiation, but from the acid. 
Then it goes to get converted into a gas, uranium hexafluoride. That gets enriched. It's another place it goes to an enrichment plant. And then the gas gets converted back into nuclear fuel. So it went through all those steps before it ever saw the nuclear reactor. Goes to the nuclear reactor, runs for four years. And then the last step in the process, as, as we have now, is to take that fuel and, um, and eventually bury it, uh, and, uh, but more likely uh, store it outside for a good hundred years. And as we saw with Fukushima, no one knows how to handle that material in a crisis situation or in a fire situation. Like people don't realize metal is, is flammable. So how could your local fire department manage that? No, you're right. What scared uh, the NRC and me the most uh, on the first week was Fukushima 4. And that fuel was sitting out in this containment with, uh, with no containment, rather. And um, if it had caught fire, the um, Brookhaven National Labs estimated that uh, it would have, uh, would have killed 186,000 people from a fuel pool fire. So it's a problem. You know, the, the, the net effect of all this, we were talking about money, um, Union of Concerned Scientists has estimated that uh, if you look at all the subsidies along the way, uh, including some of the early subsidies of nuclear, uh, it would add five cents to the production cost of a nuclear reactor. So here in Vermont, the, the production cost of Vermont Yankee is about five cents, um, which makes it close to natural gas as far as um, whether or not it's economically the low cost producer or not. But then when you add in the five cents worth of subsidies that you and I have paid over the years, suddenly it, it's not even in the ballpark. It's not in the ballpark compared to, to, to fossil fuels or solar, perhaps, do you think? Uh, it's um, the, the threshold for solar, new nukes versus uh, new solar uh, have just now crossed over. Um, it, it, within a year or two of, of, of now, prob perhaps uh, 2012, 2013, but solar costs are plummeting, as you know. You know, the, the um, uh, Chinese have cut the, the cost of solar by perhaps 30 percent or, or, or more, whereas new nukes are going up. People estimate that the um, cost of a new nuke will increase by 10 percent because of Fukushima. So you know, it was 20 billion to begin with. And by the way, Wall Street won't touch um, 20 billion to begin with. Now we're adding another 2 billion because of Fukushima. Uh, the, so they're going up. Solar's going down. Well, you know, I, I, being in New York and having worked in the financial industry, I understand 9-11 very well. Mm -hmm. And you and I were trying to talk about Bhopal offline. And in the 80s, they had a, uh, I think it was a cyanide leak or a poisonous gas leak, which affected a town of 500,000 people and basically killed 3,000 people outright. So 9-11 is a 3,000 people killed outright. Bhopal is 3,000 killed outright with hundreds of thousands, 200,000 casualties in total. What is the human cost of Fukushima, do you think, in terms of human casualty and, and, and life? And that's the problem that people have under, to understand. I mean, you've been brilliant on the technical side of things, but no one can grab around this silent killer. It's like high blood pressure of, of energy. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think the human cost is? Well, I think, um, and I'm sure the, uh, the the nuclear lobby will call your show and say I'm totally wrong, but I think that the 20-year cost of um, from Fukushima will be about a million cancers. And I, I base that on um, studies that came out of Three Mile Island, and despite what you hear, people did die at Three Mile Island. Uh, Dr. Steve Wing has done a brilliant epidemiological study that shows about a 20% increase in lung cancer three to five years after the accident. And uh, so that's just, and that was small compared to, um, uh, to Fukushima and in a much lower population density area as well. So what will happen is first you'll have thyroid cancers and, and thyroid abnormalities. Um, then you'll have lung cancers. And then you get into that period when you'll have um, organ cancers and leukemias and brain cancers and things like that. You know, the problem is it's a statistical crapshoot. The, um, the chance of, uh, you, you'll never be able to prove that I got my cancer from smoking and you got yours from Fukushima. It, that there's no way of, of uh, detecting that. But we will see a statistically meaningful increase in cancers in Japan as a result of this. 
Really, and uh, these are small per, uh, small particulates that you're talking about. I think you used the term, were they gnats, radioactive uh, gnats, I think you used once? Fuel fleas. Fuel fleas. So <laughs> how? that's what people are taking a, um, a Geiger counter. They're putting on food and saying, okay, my food is safe, but they're not considering particulate matter. What is a particulate, nuclear particulate, and how devastating could a small particulate be to you? That's that's the key to the uh, the whole discussion. The Japanese right now are measuring airborne dose. And they're walking around with their decimeter and and saying it reads whatever, but that's an airborne dose from what's on the soil that what's been previously deposited on the soil, and it doesn't take into account any of these internal exposures from hot particles that either get in your GI tract or in your lungs. We've got uh, pictures of kids' uh, sneakers loaded with cesium. And you know if it's on the sneakers, it's in their hands, and their hands are in their mouth. Um, it's, um, I'm certain that the body burden of cesium on, in kids in Fukushima Prefecture is quite high. The net effect of that, you can't measure that because your body self-shields. So if that's deep in your lung, there's, you know, there's mass between your lung and uh, where the detector is, and you won't find it. That doesn't mean it's not there. We, um, we also saw on the first week of the accident, there's a couple other nasty gases that disappear very quickly, xenon and krypton. And the concentration in air was astronomical, and, which means that the concentration in people's lungs were astronomical. Uh, the net effect of this is there's got to be you know, significant increases in cancer in, in the Japanese population. So you think a million people would be a reasonable estimate. So we have a 9-11, which is 3,000. We have uh, Bhopal, which is 3,800 or so, and 200,000 injured. And then we have Fukushima, which is a potential impact of of a million people. Is it limited to just Japan or was there radiation particulate matter worldwide? Um, you know, we're at a point where you can't run, you can't hide. The, um, the, after Japan, the, the next hottest area is the Cascades, the Pacific Cascades. Um, a lot of that radiation came across the Pacific and um, hit the mountains, hit the, hit the Rockies, and deposited on the west side of the Rockies. We've seen uh, readings in the Portland area of about 100 disintegrations per second in a square meter. So three by three has 100 disintegrations per uh, second of cesium-134 and 137. Now, Japan has thousands, so it's much less than Japan. So the, the issue is in Japan, it's a personal problem. You know, you can, you can do things in your life to minimize the risk, and you can certainly get checked frequently so that if you get a cancer, it doesn't turn into a lethal cancer. In the U.S., it's different because the, the exposure is a lower level but spread out over millions of people up and down the West Coast. So I think the, um, we'll, we'll see over time a statistically meaningful increase in cancer on the West Coast, but I don't think we'll be able to um, compare by any means to what they got in Japan. Now, well, you know, I grew up in the duck and cover age. You know, when I was in school and we had a duck and cover, we had these strange fire drills that were in fire drills and you didn't understand them. And then as an adult, you realize that they were trying to get you into the holes to, to shelter. What was the fallout on the American populace in terms of particulate radiation versus Fukushima? Um, the answer is the government, if they were looking, didn't tell us. Uh, there's three good studies out. One came from uh, University of Texas, and that was over Seattle. And they found that airborne radioactive aerosols were 100,000 times higher in April than normal. Um, and that study, although they had the data in early April, they didn't publish until September. The, um, the other one was um, down in San Diego, um, where they detected uh, radioactive uh, sodium five days after the accident which is another indication of how quickly the plume got here. Then the, uh, the third was a study by um, Marco Kaltofen, and he had an air filter in um, Seattle and uh, detected about 10 hot particles a day in the average person's lung capacity. The average person breathes about between 10 and 20 cubic meters a day. And he had, a, he had a, essentially a cigarette filter with pulling 10 to 20 cubic 
meters of air through it every day. And every day he looked at those air filters and found that they contained lots of hot particles. So, and if, if you're in Japan, how many hot particles would have, you have had through this crisis? Could it be zero oh, to... Uh... More likely 100 times higher or more. Or so more. again, again, the, we uh, uh, our, our hearts should go out for the Japanese. There will be cancers here, but compared to what the Japanese are getting, um, uh, it, it, it's just no comparison. So Arnie, let's say there's a particle that's sitting right here, sort of buzzing in my ear. I can't see it. I can't smell it. It's the size of a dust mite or smaller. How big yeah. is this thing? Oh, a couple of microns, a couple of millionths of a, of a meter. They're, they're very small, but they contain quite a few radioactive atoms. It's not one atom. You know, they can have um, hundreds of radioactive atoms in that little micron speck of dust. And it's putting out, according to my high school physics manual, alpha, beta, gamma radiation? Um, yeah, it's putting out one of the three of those. If it was, if it was a gamma ray, it would penetrate your skin and, and affect you internally. And that's what those radiation detectors measure, is external exposure. Uh, but those betas and the alphas, actually, you can you put them on your skin and um, probably you know, have no deleterious health effect. It's when they get under the skin, you know, either by, by breathing or, or uh, taking them in orally, that they begin to cause damage because then they're right up against the cell wall. And uh, so the, the particles, compared to the cloud that, that uh, these people are, are in in Japan um, that are coming off the ground now because of cesium, um, the particles in their lungs are much more damaging. Uh, I had a, a banker in Tokyo explain to me, he said, said the difference is the, be, between my approach and the International um, uh, Commission on Radiation Protection, they assume that this uh, hot particle lodges in your lung and gives energy to your lung, but they average that energy out of the whole lung. And so therefore there's not a lot of exposure. My approach is imagine your lung is a stadium filled with a hundred thousand people. And in the middle is of somebody with a, a seven shot rifle. It only shoots seven times into the crowd. Then the international uh, commission on radiation protection would say well the average energy to the crowd was very low therefore everything's okay but you and i know that seven people up there have been hit and are severely damaged that's a lot like the the uh the, the organs in uh, in your body the the lung has um, cells and seven of those cells will be damaged to the point where they may cause a cancer and that's you know the cancer breeds or spreads it's a genetic right. problem in the cell so the cell multiplies so this way, if the particulate matter goes right next to a cell, it could mutate that cell into a cancerous cell, and then all of a sudden you have cancer throughout your body. So what is the cost to Japan? We had talked about that. What's the, if we're trying to make it an economic cost, we, we can't cover the cost of, can, of a million cancer deaths over time. That's immeasurable. But what's, what's the cost? Well, the, the Japanese are averaging it out to say that the electric bills are going to go up by about three cents. Uh, not yen, but since as a result of Fukushima, I actually think it'll be higher than that. In other words, they'll amortize the cost of the Fukushima accident over the entire population and raise everybody's electric bill the equivalent of three cents. That's a lot of money. Cause it's an awful lot of, of megawatts. But I think that the, the cost is something on the order of more than 200 billion U.S. dollars. And the Japanese aren't willing to say that. They've said, well, between now and the summer of of 2012, it's going to be 13 billion, and I think it's going to be you know water torture trying to get the the entire number out of here. There's a lot of pressure to keep TEPCO Tokyo Electric um, financially solvent, and um, so what they're doing is rather than nationalizing it, selling the assets and using that money to um, keep to, to pay for a lot of the things we've been talking about. They will continue to drizzle out enough money to keep TEPCO alive. You know, I don't know if you have your slide rule there. Uh, I don't know if you have your slide rule there. But there was an actuarial cost in, assigned in 9-11. So what the, what the person that was, uh, they had a, a fund for victims of 9-11. And the uh, person that was going to distribute that fund 
basically had an actuarial cost per person. I'm sure yeah, that the one million people times three million dollars is ten to the sixth, and ten to the sixth is it's got twelve zeros behind it. It's got twelve the, zeros. Yeah. So uh, that's an unbelievably huge amount uh, of money, and I, uh, it's sad to have to put people in monetary terms. But we were talking about Bhopal, and maybe those people mm -hmm. were less valuable in the in the global culture than the people in Japan. Japan or US or Europe. I hate to say that, but that's the trend now is to make people unpersons. So that's what I'm saying is that the human cost should be factored in as part of the full cycle cost of nuclear energy. Now with the cleanup, are they going to be able to clean up this 20 square mile area? And is that's, it really 20 is it really 20 square miles or does it go all the way up to Tokyo or does it go out to the sea? What exactly is the geography and is that ever recoverable? Well, what they're talking about is um, removing as much as um, five five centimeters or two inches of soil throughout the Fukushima prefecture. Now, this is a state. Uh, if they did that, they would fill about 50 New Orleans super superdome fulls of, um, of radioactive soil. That's just for Fukushima prefecture, and that doesn't include some of the areas nearby, which actually are, are higher exposure. So the question, nobody wants that waste. So now some Japanese um, uh, scientists have said, well, we can put it in boats and take it out in the ocean and dump it. The problem with that is that the Japanese are a signatory to something called the London Dumping Convention, which prohibits dumping at sea. Now, what they're doing to get around all of this is they're, um, they're dumping it in dump trucks into Tokyo Bay and using it as landfill. So um, eventually, all this radioactive material is um, is not being uh, monitored, or and is certainly not being retained in any kind of a, a geologic uh, fashion. But in fact, is getting dumped in Tokyo Bay. I mean, to me, it's it's unbelievable because I I view the the spent fuel is almost more dangerous than the uh, reactor itself. And a forty year old reactor, you and I have already covered this. You wouldn't get it on a jet plane with that rate of failure. Yeah, there would be no aviation in the world yeah. with that now, rate of failure. One of the things that's happening here is the Japanese never had any plan for a spent fuel repository. They're years behind the United States, and of course the United States is years behind Europe. So now they are forced into admitting that we may not be recycling all of our nuclear waste. Where are we going to put it? In a high seismic country. Um, that's a uh, That's a can they've been kicking down the road for a long time and there's again billions and billions of dollars on what to do with that spent nuclear fuel that the japanese haven't even begun to think about you know with with air transport it's incredibly um safe could nuclear power ever reach that level of safety um i have a friend who says nuclear can be safe or it can be cheap but it can't be both then, and I think that's the argument. You know, it's, it boils down to money. If you want to make nuclear safe, it gets to the point where it's so costly, you don't want to build the power plant anyway, uh, especially now with plummeting renewable costs. So um, can you make a nuclear reactor safe? Yes. Can it also at the same time compete with um, renewables, which are, of course, higher than natural gas? And the answer is no. So uh, Wall Street is, you know, demanding uh, federal loan guarantees for this. And, of course, we already subsidize Price Anderson Insurance. So Wall Street won't spend the money to build it and Wall Street won't insure it. I think that's an indication that um, I, I think maybe I just answered your question. Right. It's un uninsurable unless the government steps in and insures it. I mean, I can understand why they want to do nuclear power because it provides a baseline of power, whereas solar and renewables don't. So the power is potentially always on in nuclear. So um, it, it, what about simple safe reactors that are just going to stay there in a canister for 30 years and deplete? Or what about Bill Gates' idea where he takes spent fuel and it burns down in a, in a cylinder? Is that stuff ever going to be viable or is it dangerous <laughs> too? Um, you know, it's, it's always, um, it always looks pretty when it's 20 years out in the future before you, uh, you figure out what's wrong with it. 
the the nuclear saying is that you know you you got to be 15 years old before you get zits and and i think as we go out in time and take a good look at these technologies we'll find problems but the 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 neat part about what gates is doing is he's back to small reactors and I think the, the lesson here is that these big reactors are so hard to cool. You can't force the water into the center of them uh, well enough. So um, the, the question is economic still, but at least the issue of going back to small reactors um, may eliminate the problem of um, the sizing and how the hell do you ever get water into the center of that nuclear reactor. I mean, is it possible to have something that's dry, that doesn't rely on water or sodium? Or... The... Um, uh, General Atomic back in the 70s made something called the HTGR, high temperature gas reactor, and it was cooled with helium. Um, they had all sorts of problems with the helium um, actually migrating through the stainless steel heat exchanger tubes, and they couldn't, um, they couldn't keep the helium dry enough. Um, but uh, there have been a couple of gas cooled reactors. Of course, the first meltdown was a gas cooled reactor at wind scale. In, um, in England back in the 50s, and it contaminated the whole state with um, radioactive iodine. So uh, we've tried gas reactors as well. And sodium is uh, uh, sodium's uh, volatile, is my understanding. Well, we had a meltdown in a sodium reactor as well. The, the Fermi-1 reactor right outside of Detroit had a meltdown in the early uh, 70s or late 60s. And the book was written, actually, the guy in the control room said, we almost lost Detroit, which became the name of the book. Uh, this liquid sodium burns when it hits air. So if it leaks, it burns. Um, the Japanese are, um, are shutting down a liquid sodium reactor now because they just can't get the technology to work. Uh, Richard Nixon said we need a breeder reactor. What was, it, what was that all about? When they built one, I think, a Phoenix uh, reactor somewhere? They were working on a, a, a Phoenix or Super Phoenix and uh, Tennessee Valley Authority was going to uh, build it and it was going to be sodium cooled. But um, at, at the end of the day, the costs were so astronomical, they pulled the plug. So it boils down to money again. Okay. So what would you say in conclusion? Costs of nuclear power, human costs, economic costs need to subsi subsidize. Is it the Carlisle Group, General Atomics, private industry, NRG, uh, Exelon that's driving this thing? against the numbers or because of government subsidy what what's the bottom line here well i think you know it's like when, when you have kids and the kids are 20 and they're in college they can stay home with you when the kids are 30 if they're having bad times they can stay home with you but nuclear technology has been subsidized for 70 years you now it's about time to kick the kid out of the house after 70 years the only reason these technologies are hanging around is because the department of energy is heavily subsidizing them even today Sounds like the MF Global problem where the regulator is part of the industry and vice versa. You're absolutely right. And I've seen you give testimony in Congress, and uh, it, it's quite amazing to me. It's like you're talking to a wall of sheetrock, you know. <laughs> yeah, except that's not true in Wall Street. Now, Wall Street is kind of agnostic about this, as they should be. Um but the, uh, the lobbyists from the industry and the lobbyists from the utilities, you know, let's look at Vogel. Vogel's $20 billion are down in Georgia. I'll give you $20 billion if you guarantee me 11% on it. What a great deal. Yeah, it's a winner. So government is making determining who the winners are, who the losers are, and at $5 million a person times a million persons in Japan, a lot of people are losers getting, getting economically and also in terms of cancer. Arnie Gunderson, Fairwinds uh, Associates, thank you very much for your time and for being with me today. Thanks for having me. But where Anne, Ayn Rand got it right was the process of breakdown. She could, If you read her books, she was totally wrong about the solution points, but she was totally right about the process of breakdown, where the wrong decisions are being made simply because of all the special interest, which is intervening to a predestined result, preordained mm -hmm. result. And that's the case with nuclear uh, power, in my opinion.